It's no surprise to you, this is the Space Shuttle Orbiter Discovery. Yes, sir. We, ever since we opened the doors here, had a space shuttle here, not this one. We started off with the Enterprise, the number one vehicle, whose only purpose in life was really to do the approach and landing tests to satisfy the bean counters here in Washington that we could make an unpowered glider-like landing of one of these things after a space mission, safely on a runway of our choice. Remember, unpowered, there's no chance for a second approach. So you either land or you crash, all right? Uh, that was a big step for our bean counters to buy off on us putting a 140,000 pound glider in the air and saying it'll come back from space and land where you want it to. Yeah, right. Show me. So in 1977, the Enterprise flew 13 times at Edwards Air Force Base where I was stationed to show people, the government, that we could really do this. And so we did. So we had the Enterprise for all these years. And then at the end of the program, uh, in 2011, there was kind of a lottery for the remaining three operational shuttle vehicles. And we won first place in the lottery, and we got to choose the one we wanted. So, follow me through on this. We gave up the space shuttle orbiter that had never been to orbit for the one that had been to orbit the... Most. Most. Thank you. I knew you were awake. Good. That's right. This vehicle, the Discovery, came here in April of 2012, and we swapped it out one day for the one we had by opening those doors. You can't imagine. They will open. Or even clear up to the top of the flag. We can open that. Pushed out the Enterprise, towed this one in, sent the Enterprise off on top of the shuttle carrier aircraft up to New York City, which is where it is now. You've heard of the Intrepid Museum up there, have you? I've never been there but uh, that's where it is. It's in a building across from the aircraft carrier of downtown, they say. Okay, so let's talk about the Discovery, our new treasure, all right? So it has been to orbit and back 39 times. Holy mackerel, can you imagine? You see all these gray streaks and stuff on there? That's what happens when you come through a hypersonic re-entry into the atmosphere 39 times uh, with it, all its attendant heat and high temperatures, like up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So anyway, it's all thermally protected where necessary. In those uh, 39 trips up there, uh, coincidentally, you might say, it has spent exactly one full year in space. 365 days of its life have been in space. It's fun to consider how many times it's been around the world. Don't you think? I mean, it's kind of silly, but it's okay. It takes an artificial satellite of the Earth, 90 minutes to go around. And so if you divide that into 365 days, it turns out this has been around the world 5,800 times. And it's done some really good stuff. When it started off its life, it was basically flown by Air Force crews. The Air Force was a major player in the shuttle program at the beginning. And these Air Force crews were doing Air Force missions. We don't really know what they were doing, but that's okay. We'll get over it. We still don't know. Later in its life, it began to do more nearly NASA normal missions, like putting satellites in orbit and going up and repairing them and uh, bringing them back in some cases and uh, doing all the experiments they do up there. And then along comes the International Space Station. Oh, yes. Do you realize the International Space Station is about a million pounds? and it's bigger than a football field, and all the structural components were taken up by the shuttle. Do you realize that? Well, that holds hands very nicely with the initial contact contract idea of the shuttle. It was supposed to be a truck. Look how ugly its shape is. It's like a craft cheese box with stubby wings, isn't it? It's kind of ugly. Well, they didn't make it ugly on purpose. They made it ugly because <coughs> The specification was that its cargo bay had to be able to hold something 60 feet long and 15 feet in diameter and weigh as much as 50,000 pounds. Now that's one problem. And the other thing, which is uh, you know a little beyond the normal uh, exposure of people like us, is that you don't just send something steaming into the atmosphere like this 
uh, shaped in some cute shape with a pointy nose and all the stuff we're accustomed to with airplanes. It wouldn't work. The heat load would destroy it. You have to have something blunt like this in order to cope with the intense heat loads. This is the only shape that would work. And we learned stuff like that in what we call the lifting body programs of some years ago uh, that were also conducted out at Edwards Air Force Base. Okay. So uh, one of the missions that I want to tell you about, I should stop. Thank you. Um, one of the missions I want to tell you about, uh, we're all particularly proud of in the history of the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery, and that is the placement into orbit initially, 25 years ago, of the multi-billion dollar Hubble telescope. You know about the Hubble, you've heard about it. If you've ever looked on the internet for some images from the Hubble telescope, they will absolutely blow your mind. It's, it's humbling to see those pictures and appreciate how big this universe is compared to the speck known as our Earth. It is amazing, okay? So it not only took the Hubble telescope up there successfully 25 years ago this year, but on two of the servicing missions of the four or five there have been, they were also flown by this vehicle to go up there and basically remanufacture the Hubble telescope in space. Lots of the stuff has been replaced or repaired, upgraded, so that it's as good as it is today, which is much better than it was when we put it up there in the first place, okay? Uh, flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, it has to encounter the atmosphere as it comes down a little bit. And in doing so, it starts this terrible heat load. 3,000 degrees on the nose cap, 3,000 degrees approximately on the leading edge of the wings. That is the highest quality of the thermal protection system on those spots. And that stuff is called RCC, reinforced carbon-carbon, uh, very, very temperature tolerant and also very brittle and fragile. See, so you don't want to bang on it. All right, the next thing is then the whole, the nose and all of the underbody, all of it, including all the way under the wings, you can probably just about see is the next high temperature field because the plane's coming in like this, see? And it can stand about 2,700 degrees. Then you go to white tiles like you see up on those orbiting maneuvering pods up on the tail top there. You see they're white tiles. They're good for about 2,500 degrees. And then, quite amazingly, you look on the side here and you see what you would absolutely swear looks like a quilt. Well, it is. And it's made of some special silica materials, but is implied in the form of more or less a blanket. Isn't that strange? So there's your thermal protection system, and it's reusable. It's also fragile, and the tiles are very, very expensive because each one is custom designed with its own serial number and uh, has to be replaced from time to time. In fact, after we lost one of the shuttles for having some damage to it when it was ascending, without our knowledge, it went into the re-entry with some of its heat protection system screwed up and it was destroyed. See? So after that, they developed um, on-orbit repair kits for the astronauts so they could actually make satisfactory one-time use repairs on the thing till they could get it home safe. Those are hinges up there. Those yeah, they are. And they're funny, aren't they? Here you have a hypersonic vehicle with big, fat, ugly hinges like you buy at Home Depot on the side. Well, I want to tell you something else about that, uh, that big top that opens like that. You hold this for me, please. Let them talk about it. Okay, now you all know, don't you, that when anything is in orbit, it's in complete, utter weightlessness, right? You know that. Completely, completely utter weightlessness, okay? So these doors were made to only really be operable in weightlessness. They're very fragile. You can't open these doors unsupported on the ground. In order to open them on the ground, you have to put these big trusses on it to help it from falling apart, see, as you open it. Isn't that interesting? So you see these great ugly hinges, but then they're hooked to this really fragile 
pop, so to speak, that, that can only be opened by hooking it up with trusses to support its own weight when it's on the ground, yet in orbit it can open and close, you know, with impunity. All right, isn't that kind of interesting? The, the, um, the hinges are actually in a, a low, uh, non-threatening flow environment, you might say, you see, so they're not a, a cause of any difficulty. Uh, I, I like to tell this little story just by way of uh, the final exam here, and that is, you see these holes all over the thing, and most people say, what in the world are all these holes in this thing for? And they're everywhere. So one day when there weren't any people in here, I walked around this thing, and I counted up all of the rocket motors that are in this picture right here that you can see for the launch, and all of these holes, which are rocket exhausts, every single one of them. And there are little baby rockets, and there are gigantic rockets. Now think about this. Why are there little baby rockets? When the space shuttle is in orbit, it is not only in weightlessness, but moving the flight controls is an utter waste of time. There's no air, see? So you want to sit there, move the flight controls, enjoy yourself. There's nothing out there. <laughs> So it's critical that the uh, attitude of the aircraft be able to be adjusted. They do this to conduct experiments. They do to expose the, the uh, open cargo bay to instrumentation that needs to see the Earth sometimes. They even need to rotate the vehicle sometimes to keep the heat load okay, because the sun is enormously intense out there. So when it's hit by the sun, it's hot. When it's not hit by the sun, it's really cold. See? All kinds of reasons, but the most important reason is you will die if you don't have the ability to turn the vehicle around to the anti-flight direction and fire the retro rockets. You could never come out of orbit. There he goes. He's been up there since the last century. He's dead, but he's still up there. You know, that's what you get. You've got to be able to fire those rockets that are in those big home pods back there, 6,000-pound rockets, to say, hey, not so fast. Let's go down now, okay? That's what you do. But see, you have to be able to point the thing. So that's what all these little rockets are for. All over the nose, all over the tail, all over whatever. You have to be able to control the attitude. Imagine if somebody came up to, to one of these, or this thing came up to the International Space Station to dock. Can you imagine how precise the docking maneuver is? I mean, you're taking a 140,000 pound thing and moving it in here at inches per second to a target that's only as big as the end of your finger. I mean, is that attitude control or what? And it's all done by rocket motors, see? Little puffs sometimes. So I counted up all those rockets, and there's 41 rockets on that thing when it's ready for takeoff. 41 different rockets are fueled up and ready to go. Now, I don't told you that the little ones are really low, like 25 pounds, maybe even 6 pounds, I think. But I want to talk to you just in the last few minutes here about the big ones. In the center body, there are reusable liquid rocket motors that burn cryogenics, uh, liquid oxygen, and liquid hydrogen. For takeoff, each of those three motors there that are right here, each one of those three makes almost 400,000 pounds of thrust. But that is completely dwarfed by the amount of thrust on the two external rocket boosters. The external rocket boosters, which you see right here, you see one of the two. Those beauties make 3.3 million pounds of thrust each for takeoff. So you add 3.3 plus 3.3 plus 1.2 million, you've got yourself 7.8 million pounds of thrust when this thing decides to go fly. That's why the whole state of Florida goes like this when it goes up, see? So anyway, let's drop back and see the whole program from a bird's eye view. We've talked about the discovery, yeah, 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 that's wonderful, but it's hard to recall, isn't it, that this program was going on for 30 years. 30 years. And in all those years, they went up in the shuttle 135 times. Awful lot of people went up there. An awful lot of things got taken up there. It was kind of an amazing program. And now, after demonstrating for 30 years the beauty of a reusable spacecraft, guess what we're doing now? Going back to expandables. I don't understand all this. <laughs> but anyway, I do understand this. You guys have had enough. I'm tired of talking. You're tired of listening. Let's go do something else. Okay? Thank you very much.